Wednesday Night Talk. We are very glad to receive today Maur Applebaum. We have been working with uh, incredible bands like Yes, Mid Love, uh, Dream Theater, Face No More, Ingui Malstim, among many others. So uh, I'm always curious to know um, uh, a little bit um, about the, uh, the people I interview, some biographic elements. How did you become a sound engineer? It's uh, uh, opportunity, passion, and why mastering specifically? Uh... Well, uh, I think sound engineering was kind of a calling in a way. Um, from a young age, I loved music probably like a lot of other people. And I've had bands that I played with uh, and performed. And then uh, I had recorded, you know, in a studio with the band. We didn't have a, a like a good budget. It was like we were kids and we went to a studio to record. You know, it was all the money we had. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we didn't really have much money, but I remember going into that environment, seeing the console and like, yeah, this is something I want to do, you know, and I, it was just, uh, it was grabbing me and um, I kept uh, getting interested in it and going to shops of equipment and, and reading brochures and I don't know, thinking of the gear and then reading some books. There were not many books back then, but whatever it was there um and it just it just fascinated me you know the the world of recording and production and i wasn't aware of mastering back then but um but the whole thing was fascinating in terms of like wow you can actually get the music that's being played to a medium and you know and you can play that back and you can add stuff um it was really, you know, now we're, we're thinking of it, it's kind of flashbacking me a lot of years ago, <laughs> uh, more than three decades at least. But um, yeah, yeah, I think that's, you know, it was a combination of, of being a musician and loving the technical aspects. And uh, so that brought me to sound engineering. And later on, I found my niche mastering because I felt that that's where I can bring uh, probably bring the best of me because I always listen to music as a final result and and throughout the years I was working as a broadcasting engineer and I had a radio show too and I had been DJing at clubs mm -hmm. and I was a music journalist so I think doing all that is always mm -hmm. part of the process of getting things out to the world. Mm -hmm. So mastering was the buffer between what's happening in the studio and what's happening in the outside world. It's the last piece of the studio element. Um, the last um, artistic and technical uh, uh, stage where um, where you have control on what's coming out. And um, how did you um, study or learn mastering? You, you, you met some other mastering sound engineers or it was a, a part of practical approach? How, how did you train for? Um, I only learned sound engineering. Like in general, you know, I went to a mm -hmm. course that taught me basic stuff and you know, live sound and basic recording, not deep, you know, it was enough to start something. And then I worked in studios. I worked in um, rehearsal rooms and studios, and then I worked in broadcasting and mastering was not something I had learned in a, in an institution. Mm -hmm. I just played around with it and made a bunch of mistakes and learned from them and Make more. We all do, yeah. That's and learn point. from them. And yeah. sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And from the ones you did, you learn something. And the ones that, the, you know, it, it really, I, I was not mentored in mastering and I wasn't studying it. It was something I had to learn on my own and figure out 
things and build my studio throughout the years and add, subtract gear. Um, you mentioned that you were all, or you are a, mu a musician. What kind of instrument are you playing or where are you playing? Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, it depends how you look at it. Mm -hmm. I haven't done any music in almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. Originally, I was a bass player. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say I was an accomplished bass player, but I played good enough to be in the bands I was part of and, and write material with them. Uh, I did record a bunch of records with different bands of my own. Um, I also played some synthesizers, you know, keyboards and stuff like that. Not trained keyboard player, but just, you know, hitting the right, the right notes that made me feel that it sounds good. <laughs> um, but I haven't done music in such a long time. I, I used to do a lot of experimental music and some industrial music and gothic music and metal music and some other types of uh, kind of blended stuff, you know, hybrid music. Um, uh, until I was doing music until I moved to the States and then I went to work for producer Sylvia Massey, where there I worked as part of her staff engineers. Mm -hmm. So I would do, I do some mastering for some stuff. Uh, I would do recordings for some stuff or assisting some mixing for some projects as well. Uh, some basic tech work, you know, like doing, you know, studio maintenance stuff. So I was kind of doing all around stuff there. Uh, assisting in recording, assisting in mixing, mixing, uh, doing some recording, some mastering, some just studio all around guy kind of. And I did that for for uh, about eight months every day, all day, including weekends. It it, it was a it was a, a very interesting period because I just came to America. And, and so I did that in the beginning. Uh, you are talking right now from your studio and uh, there are others interviews amazing where we can see step by step your um, your gear. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I would like anyway to, um, uh, to know uh, more about it. And uh, why, for example, did you feel uh, interesting to have some classics... Um, um, Compressors or EQ modified for your specific use? That's a good question. Um, I'll show you uh, right now. Uh, this is mm -hmm. uh, this is the current desk that I have. Mm -hmm. um, I have more gear um, elsewhere. Uh, but this is like the main desk. Um, the reason I've, I've uh, it started with them really like uh, tweaking some stuff, but uh, I also have custom gear that is developed with me. Mm -hmm. Like I'm part of the design, like the oven that I have a collaboration with Handy Amps, uh, the stove, which I also have a collaboration with Handy Amps. And we have a few others, uh, the toaster and a few others in the works. Then I have a few uh, units that I've done with Roger Foot for foot control systems. One is called the workshop. You have sign one. signature models, if I'm getting yes. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, one one is called the workshop, one is called the bench, and one's called the torch. And then I have other stuff that was built for me not with my design with them but more of just for me like uh like modified versions of the magic death i compressor like an old version that has some tweaks in it that i and specifically did for me he also built me a specific coloration box and then i have um other boxes that like i said there was like tweaking of parts and basically the customization or signature whatever you know in that situation or the cook or or the specific build is because there are certain tones or sonic mm -hmm. uh, attributes that the unit has that i was looking for and i would hear the original version and if i like it we'll keep it as is and if i think 
I need a, a different sound, then I would mention what I'm looking for, and then we'll, we'll we would test out and see, you know, maybe it's a certain tube that needs to be changed, or a few of them. Maybe it's certain parts. Uh, maybe it's an additional function. So, a lot of these things have added features or changes in the sound. Uh, especially my own custom signature stuff, which which is unique to that. And some stuff, such as the oven and the stove, which are out for people to to purchase, uh, they're based on uh, collaboration between Handy Amps and me. Mm -hmm. And that is the features and functions that I was looking for to have in a device and it's tuned by our collaborative efforts of, of you know how our ear you know likes it so it's a taste thing but with that we got something really good going there and um, and I'm happy with the results and my my versions are prototypes so they're a bit different because they have other features that either we took off or added or um, or subtracted later on or so they're also a bit different but it's all custom and, and the whole chain here is very proprietary I I test so many things I test cables I test clocks. yeah it I doesn't test. surprise me yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, right. it's it's uh, for for even for some sound engineers that are more dedicated to recording or mixing, when uh, mastering sound engineers start to speak about this, these details, sometimes they appear as, as crazy. But when you, I feel like when you push the thing to uh, to this uh, level of details, each step, cables, tubes, uh, even the uh, the, the, the transformers inside every unit matters in, at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, it's the sum of the parts. You know, they all they all add up differently. You know, you change one part, it changes the whole thing. Mm -hmm. it, it goes down to the, even the electricity here. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a. It's not just a dedicated circuit. I have like a regulator. I have a balancer, conditioner. I mean, you name it. I I really wanted to tweak this system and mm -hmm. and it's it's never ending i can't you know i'm not going to tell you oh it's great and it's going to stay like that it's great till i find the next thing that i like mm -hmm. oh so like and 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 i test a lot of stuff i get a lot of stuff to test and i hear and i'm like oh you know what i like this or i like that and 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 if someone comes to me and says hey man i just you know hey man or hey Hey, you know, I, I just made a new, I don't know, inter, you know, converter or, or processor or something, and they're willing to have me try out a demo. Yeah, I will do so. You know, if, if it's something that could fit my chain here and bring something new to the table, which I like, mm -hmm. then yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. You know, and every once in a while I hear of something, I bring in a demo. Some of it is great stuff, but doesn't add to my chain or, or doesn't fit what I'm working on. So even if it's good, then, you know, it doesn't get in. But it, it, but some stuff is really good, but interesting in, to me or adding a flavor that I'm missing mm -hmm. or I want, you know, and or, or another versatile approach to things, you know, like, oh, this can bring me something I didn't have, which can fit these projects. And yeah, I'll bring it in. No. Yeah, and and when you say about people being cra considered crazy, I, I get it. Yeah. You know, maybe I am. <laughs> yeah, it, it's too for uh, some yeah young musician who are starting. It's it's important to precise that it's not about even the settings that you are going to have on a, on a specific uh, hardware. It's you switch on the unit and you can immediately hear that there is already some kind of flavor to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We we call it box tone. Mm -hmm. That when when the signal just goes through the box, mm -hmm. it has a sound, mm -hmm. and that's usually the first parameter mm -hmm. that, that at least I and I I know a lot of others will do the same. But that's that's the first thing we notice. You know, if we turn, turn the unit on, and we like the sound of the box, like it doesn't ruin it, that's the first criteria. You know. And uh, 
even if you change things, if uh, you are never in a comfort zone to use a modern expression, is there a unit you, you cannot live without inside the, the sound chain of your studio? Is there really a, a piece of hardware that it's will remain here whatsoever? Yeah, me. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> you and your ear. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, look, let, let's, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to say it's the ear and not the gear because mm -hmm. even with the ear, we choose certain gear. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, True. we make decisions True. based on what we work with. Okay. And we can get amazing results with a lot of stuff, but mm -hmm. still we make choices. So I think it's a combination of the ear and the gear and the ear will stare you to a certain direction. The gear will give you a certain sound running through it. So every piece here has its attributes and I won't deny it. Could I work without it? Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could I work with just plugins? Yes. Mm -hmm. Would I get the same results? No. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's every, every, as long as I have a, a system to listen, you know, headphones or, or speakers or that are in good quality and, you know, and, and, you know, as long as the basics are there, I can work with whatever's given. Mm -hmm. Would I give the results I'm aiming for all the time with what's given? Well, it's circumstantial. No, that's what it is. I'll work with it as is and do the best I can. But when I have the choice to work with gear, which is what's the current situation, I have the gear and I can work with it, then of course I'll use it because it gets me faster to where I want to and it gets me the results that I want. And the clients enjoy it. I'm sure they, they would enjoy you know, something else as well, you know, in terms of, you know, if they didn't hear this and they only heard a different version, it, it, it would be workable. I mean, unless they have any revisions that they want me to do, but the fact that I have the, the gear to work with and I can get the results I want, you know, if I'm happy and they're happy, we're all happy, you know, unless they need changes, but a lot of times I see in interviews, people talk about how gear is not important. It's the year. Well, I, it's not that I disagree. I just want to be realistic about it. Okay. The ear is what you hear and what you make decisions from. The gear is a tool to get there. Okay. Not every gear will give you the same result. So the gear is part of the equation. Your ear makes decisions and, and you make choices. If, if you go to a recording studio and you barely have gear to work with, you'll get the results you can with what you have. And of course, if your ear is good, you'll get the best results you can. Okay? But if I would ask you, here's all the gear. Choose what you want. You will choose the ones that fit what you want to work with, with your taste. So, of course... The gear is cardinal to the results because you choose them based on knowing that this certain preamp has a sound that you like, this mixer you like, this compressor, this whatever. So it's not right to um, delete the word gear from the equation. It's the ear and the gear. And the ear is the most important part. But if the gear is not right, you're going to work harder to get the results with your ear. If the gear is right for the project, okay, and I'm saying for the project because some gear is right for other projects. But if that gear specifically works for this project, you're going to get quicker results with better sound. Using your ears... So, it's all part of the equation. <clears throat> Another thing that is part of the equation is um, understanding um, the uh, the style of music or 
what what the uh, the client aims for and uh, these um, years I, I according to the discography on your website you have been doing a lot of metal bands albums uh, tell me if I'm wrong not only I suppose but there are a lot of famous uh, metal bands what is specific to this style of music in terms of mastering I think there is a lot to say about it in in my in my opinion a, it's a good question um, because I do a lot of types of music. I've worked for many things from classic, cinematic, jazz, rock, funk, singer, songwriter, acoustic, avant garde, electronic, EDM, uh, you know, goth, industrial, punk, reggae, rockabilly. I, I, I can keep naming, you know, metal, uh, you know, metal, different types of metal, you know, like death metal, thrash, heavy metal. Um, you know, uh, Latin music, reggaeton, you know, I've, I've done so much, pop, R&B, soul. Um, I get a lot of rock and metal because a lot of the clients that I worked with in those fields are more known. You know, so like, for example, prog rock, progressive rock, whatever, art rock, um, I've done, you know, bands like Yes and Nectar, bunch of those and in the metal prog progressive rock I've worked with progressive metal or I've worked with Dream Theater with uh, Sons of Apollo Sons of Apollo I worked with uh, Fate's Warning you know, and, a, and a bunch of other you know bands that are in that field too so you know and then in the death metal I've done a bunch of bands or I've done even more like experimental metal bands like Cynic um, and then you know so uh, and, and then, you know, I've done artists like you said, Ingve Malmsteen, and, um, and I've done, uh, you know, Faith No More, which is kind of the metal with the alternative rock. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, then, you know, the hard rock bands like Dokken and Lita Ford, and, and I've done stuff for Rob Halford, and the heavier stuff like Sepultura, and Abath, and Mayhem, and then. You know, it's like that, that, that. You know that that that's even more heavy than you know. That's not heavy metal. That's already you know black metal and all that stuff. And uh, the threat. I mean, I can I can name drop a bunch. It's just it's it's the the list goes on and on. I think that what happens is that in time when you do more and more of a certain genre, you become more knowledgeable of the inner differences because there is a difference between heavy metal. And thrash metal and then from or speed metal and then for death metal or, or black metal and then there's Swedish metal you know in the Swedish metal you have three Swedish death metal or Swedish heavy metal or Swedish black metal and then then you have you know South American metal and they all have their own differences and and um, basically you kind of just need to be aware of them enough so when you're doing a record let's say you're doing a, a death metal record, if it's an old school style, you need to know how old school death metal sounds. So you're not going to modernize it. Okay? Uh, you know, because you want to keep it that way. You know, when, when you're doing an organic thrash, you know, or, you know, then you keep it that. But, but if it's more modern, even if it's a legacy band, but they're more modern, then you need to know where the modern sound goes to. So metal has so many subgenres that are very specific, you know. Uh, rock has a lot of subgenres, but the subgenres in rock have subgenres in them. So like in prog rock, you have different types of prog rock, you know, and then, you know, in alternative rock, you have a huge amount of types of alternative rock, you know, and, and, and so each one is so different, but metal, metal kind of has a housing of, of you know, this is the house of metal. And you have this, 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 and this room, this room, this room. And each one has its own um, aesthetics. And then there's eras. Like, this is the aesthetics of thrash metal from the eras of 1980 till 90-something. There's current thrash metal. Same with death metal. You know, 90s death metal to today's death metal. You know, uh, heavy metal end of 70s era till a maybe 
90 and then from 90 you had a different heavy metal and then after that you have a different you know so the, you need to know the genre you know it's not just making it loud <laughs> you know but precisely that was the uh, the meaning of my question it's i think we can agree that the uh, conception about loudness has uh, changed quite a bit for a decade because of the broadcasting reasons uh more and more on streaming, but precisely there are some very um, a, a different type of audience in metal. Who, they keep buying records, or or they buying records in a different way. Maybe it depends also of the genre. A lot of parameters like this. So, uh, as loudness change for a lot of styles, I was wondering how you. Um, are working on this problem of uh, trying to find the energy inside metal. And energy is not only loudness, it's presence, it can be space, can be found through a certain type of EQ, if you uh, get my my question. Hey, I agree with you. Um, I think that in my case, because I can't speak for others, any record record song ep album whatever you want to call the incoming format or out, outgoing format anything that comes in i treat it as its own thing i don't reference a record to a record so what comes in i listen to it fresh you know i'm here all the time i listen to it fresh i'm trying to understand what's there and every recording has a clue to where it's gonna go now, the clue can be, I'm heading this direction, can you improve me a bit? Or, I'm heading this direction, can you improve me way more? Or, or how to improve, and it's all taste, okay? So, but, and I might be wrong, I might be doing something that I think sounds good, and then the client can say, oh no, that's not the direction I went with, I wanted, you know, and, and it's a guessing game. So I'm guessing what you're going to like. Okay. I'm doing what I think works, but I'm guessing if you're going to like it. And hopefully you will. And, uh, and if you do like it, great. If not, then we make the changes. Um, in terms of, of how to get there with the energy, that's where I think that's where the, 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 that's where the secret sauce is. Okay understanding what's needed and how much of that you know if you put too much sauce you're gonna get sauce and then the, with the salad yeah. okay and the idea is to put the right seasoning that doesn't overpower the music so you're not over you're not you can change it but you don't want it to be sounding like it wasn't supposed to be there. The, the idea is to make it feel like it was there from the get-go. Like they recorded like that. And the energy can be a combination of, you know, how much you push in, either to the limiter or to the gear, how much saturation is there, if there's need. Not everything needs saturation. You know, a lot of stuff doesn't need, but some does. How much coloration you want from the gear and the coloration will be you know if it's darker or brighter you know if if how the mid-range response is it more attacking forward or it's a bit smoothed or scooped high end how much clarity you want in the high end or you want it a bit more rounder how much low end is either it's pushing hard round or it's pushing hard tight or you're doing it smooth, so it's barely feeling that it's pushing, but it's just there, kind of uh, embracing it. Those are a lot of, uh, you know, it's like cooking, you know, in a kitchen. You know, there's I got enough feeling, spices yeah. plate. Yeah. 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 Um, it's it's that's really like I, you know, that's that's where the magic is, knowing how much of what to apply and finding the way to apply it in a way that it feels part of the music. And um, 
it, um, how are the relationship with some clients that maybe um, didn't get exactly now what is at stake with uh, this new streaming loudness levels uh, requirement from the platforms? Do uh, did, did it change something in the relationship? Because, oh, okay, we want this thing to sound louder. And you say, really, guys, it's not a good idea. How, how, how is it going now? In, uh... Well, um, years ago, you know, records I've done like way, way long time ago, were, a lot of them were not so loud. So now when you put them on streaming services, they actually have a lot of dynamics compared to stuff. But um, later on, you know, per request, and you get to a point where sometimes the loudness is part of the tone. It's not just volume, it's just it's how things yeah. explode or break apart. You try to find the sweet spot where where it doesn't tire the listener. And to be honest with you, there are records that I've done that are super loud, okay? And people dig them. Bands dig them, the labels dig them, the fans dig them. And some of them are way lower, or in, and some of them are in between. I think each project just calls for something else, and I find that some records I can get loud and still sound good. Some records, when you get them loud, they start to lose something. And it doesn't mean anything in terms of the quality of the mix or the production. It's just some records get loud and stay cool there. Some records, they start to lose the emotional impact. They start to be flattened, and it doesn't always work. Um, when I deliver uh, masters, I deliver them, I think, to, to sound equal on most platforms as much as possible. I can't predict exactly what each streaming service uh, algorithm will do. So there's, I don't think there's a reason to try to fight that. I think it's best to just supply something that everybody's approving and hopefully in time their algorithms will improve and what they got will sound better but if you try to start figuring out what they are doing and then counter attacking it with different solutions it's endless yeah, yeah. it's endless because now you need every steering service needs a different one and then they can change their algorithms anytime without you even knowing it so then the next upgrade of algorithm might sound different so you know it's shooting in the dark and you know you don't know where uh, where you're hitting with it you know and i i would say better just get something that you you know sounds good and the client checked it on all their systems and they were happy with and you're happy with and uh hopefully it will translate good is there something uh, that mastering cannot do? I, I, maybe it's a weird question, but... Uh... It's a good question. Yeah, mastering can't write a good song. Okay? Yeah. You know, mastering can make a song sound better to people, translate better. It can make it maybe excite more because of the sound, maybe get you moving to the groove better because you enhanced the groove yeah that's possible but um to tell you that the mastering will make a song successful or not it can improve its uh it can improve its opportunities to get better to the listener because it will translate better it can improve it's uh, connectivity to the listener, but it's not going to make a bad song, make people dig it. So, yeah, um, it, it, do you um, often um, feel the need to be um, uh, connected or maybe uh, we, uh, what, to have some notes from uh, the mixing sound engineer or you take the project um, from scratch? Let's from scratch. Yeah, the, uh... Every project that comes in, I try to create a, a kind of a, a a a line of communication. 
So, for example, if I can talk to the producer, mixer, whoever's involved, I'll do an initial talk with them just to see, you know, know what's coming into me. Um, you know, make sure I have the files that I need and, and, and the information. And sometimes I'll have questions just so I understand better, you know, where it's going, like output formats or, you know, what's their expectations or what they don't like. You know, some stuff they don't like, and it's good to know that up front, you know. Uh, and maybe if there's stuff they like. Um, there's records that caught to me, and I just, there was no communications besides, here's the mixes, work them, and send back. Yeah, there, there were a lot of those projects. But there's also a lot of projects where there's like an initial talk, conversation, or email thread, or it depends, I if we can talk on the phone, always better, I think, because it uh, cuts it cuts the um, misinformation more times because you can ask immediately and respond immediately and there's a better dialogue. But sometimes it just goes by email or chat. Um, I think it's important because we're all involved in the process. But today, more and more processes like this are remote, so... It's not uncommon that you just get it and work it and, and set it back and hopefully they like it. Um, how do you see the future of mastering? Um, in term, It can be about technique, it can be uh, progress you expect or worries you have. Well, I think that let's start with the worries because my worry is that as much as there's more mastering engineers today than before, because a lot of people now have access to the gear and they can do it, some do it really good. Uh, I think that a lot of times there's cutting corners. Uh, some record labels are cutting budgets down. And when they're cutting budgets, they're the first place that gets cut is in the mastering. So then sometimes the mixing engineers have to master it or themselves um, due to the budgets uh, or, or you know or and 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 I think that and some stuff is just mixed you know with the limiter you know going or, or clipping it or whatever to, to get to that level and um, due to like budgets or, or and I think that affects the results in the long run. Uh, I think having mastering engineers as dedicated mastering engineers, people who are at the end of the process, they're taking the song that was mixed and taking it to the next level and, and giving it the, you know, the, the, the touch it needs, you know, that's very important. And I think it's being devalued now more and it's being devalued I think because the tools are out there so anybody can do it they, there's always this thing where someone says oh I have a friend who who has on the computer or something and you know it's like the, sometimes I talk to a producer and says oh yeah the band wanted to go to their friend who has the you know it you know well if their friend is capable of getting great results then by all means go to him he's your friend and he's giving you great results but but the profession is a profession it's not just you know there is a reasoning behind you know the importance of the results that come out from it um, and uh, so yeah that's one of the things I think uh, I do see growth in the mastering in terms of the amount of engineers uh, back in the day there were only a small amount of them worldwide and now there's so many which which is good you know because it, it shows that the business is growing and at the same time there's more gear being manufactured for them and of course there's more plugins and all that um, so the technology goes in hardware and software and, and develops and, and it's great um, 
I hope that the artists and the labels will be uh, more open to investing more in that even if the budgets are low to uh, allocate enough for it because still it's it's work time it's investment you know people put the time and effort they can sit for hours working on it you know and they might have studios that have huge amount of gear that they invested in and the time they invested in the craft so i hope that the future will be good and 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 but you never know because there's ai mastering too and uh that's one of my question indeed yeah mm -hmm. you know and some of the results are okay some of them are bad some of them are horrible and some of them are fine you know it it really depends on what comes in and and of course you know there's taste you know you it might sound fine but somebody can do maybe a, a better job that makes it sound even better not everybody's testing you know how each thing sounds um the algorithms are getting better because there's more input and more experience uh, being fed to those AI systems. The database uh, is, uh, is huge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they can check so many records and, and also they get feedback from other people and, uh, you know, they, they, and, and they probably start find something that people like and they can apply it. Um, it doesn't mean it's customized for the song and the music, but it could still work. And if your mix sounds good to you and you just need volume, it might work, you know, but it might not be as emotional engaging as a job done by an actual mastering engineer who brings much more to the table, something more organic and something, you know, more human. The bright side could be also that in the future there will be some kind of uh, calibration profile included in some headphones because I feel like we have lost sometimes the, uh, the, 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 the culture of quality of hi-fi that there was in the 80s and 90s. The, 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 you, you see what I mean? It's uh... Well, part of the reasoning for that is 80s and 90s were great eras in terms of uh, music sales. I mean, 90s, there was huge sales, you know, even 80s, yeah. And people consumed music um, in, some of them in very low quality systems and some in okay and better, but still the consumption of music was not only huge but it was profitable so when it was profitable the competition was important because it could mean getting further like with the results like if you have better sounding quality people are going to come to you so if you had a great sounding studio with great gear and it sounds amazing now you would get clients that have bigger budgets too and or or the clients that were competing with others and that's why it was a game of inches or meters even like you would make big changes and you know there was a whole scene here that there was only like there were the big studios that did the big records and then you had smaller studios doing demos and they would make a lot of money just doing demos recording demos for artists that they would the artists would send to a manager or to a label and then get uh, signed and then go to the big studio so the the differences were bigger also back then home recording was not the same quality as today today records are done at home per se okay the quality today is amazing so you can get great results. It doesn't mean it's going to sound like a record that was done in the 80s in a good room with a good console and, you know, stuff, you know, all the gear. But back then, the aim for quality was higher because you started from lower. Today, 
consumer DAWs, you know, like the, even the cheap ones to make beats on, they already sound quite good. And uh, there's a lot of productions done on them. So I don't think they're aiming for higher quality now as they, as like they did in the 80s because the gaps are smaller. Now the differences are smaller, except if you're recording on real gear, like consoles and stuff like that. That's uh, yeah. That you 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 give a great insight. I think we have lost some variety. The price to pay is a, there is a lot of things pre-made also in uh, in music mm -hmm. production. Back in the day, um, studios were different. So even if you would record on the same gear, the gear didn't sound the same due to maintenance, electricity, cabling, you know, operating it. Um, and so even if it was the same piece of gear, the recording would sound different, you know, um, due to a, a lot of these parameters. Nowadays, the consistency is so close because a lot of them use the same plugins, same presets, same drum samples, so Absolutely. same VST instruments. So they usually choose from a certain ones that they like, and those rotate, you know, but a lot will use the same. And so you'll start getting mixes that sound more similar because even if they change EQ differently, but they have similar things, similar drum samples, similar uh, uh, guitar profile, amp profiles, or, you know what I mean? There's less variables. So that's why a lot of things are similar today than they were before because... Um, it's all handed to you. Back then, you had to find the the right things to make. You know, you had to get your own samples that you made if you needed to make, or you know, you had to have a Lin drum or a or a Forat system or whatever. You know, and you had to connect it to the mixer and the pre and you know the line in. The, you know, they all changed the sound. Now you just drag and drop the samples, and uh, it's a bit different uh, because now. The accessibility to it uh, also makes it um, uh, easier to work with and easier to get good sounds, but they're the same sounds. So, so my last question uh, is, um, as far as you can remember in your childhood, what is the first memory you have connected to sound or music? This will probably sound like the standard. <laughs> I think, I think maybe listening to Sgt. Pepper mm -hmm. and also I listened to a lot of radio when I was a kid and uh, you know songs pop out from the radio and, and back then the songs were even way more different you know. Um, I think that that affected it, you know, subconsciously. And then, you know, going to shows as a teenager. Uh, I remember when I was a teenager, I was playing bass, and I tried to pick up the bass notes from the records, and it was hard sometimes to hear the bass. So I would I would put a record on the phone, you know, the record player phonograph you know. and instead of listening to it in 33 uh, 33 and third I will put it on 45 <laughs> and it pitched it up and then I could hear the bass movement better okay interesting and that that's how I like if I wanted to learn some bass lines or ideas when putting it on 45, it pitched it up. When it's pitched up, it's easier to hear it on the system. And that's how I kind of picked up. Of course, it's way faster, but uh, but you pick up stuff from that. And um, and and I was you know copying cassettes to cassettes and making compilation cassettes. So all that started doing stuff, and I was playing with you know like bass and treble and. 
you're like, oh, this is interesting. You can make it brighter, you know. And, and, and of course, brighter was the first thing you did back then, I think, because <laughs> the cassettes were kind of dull. So I think that's probably what what made me gravitate to sound. And, yeah, it's interesting to think of it after all these years. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much for being with us. If you uh, love this uh, video and interview, drop a like, subscribe, share on social network to help the growth of this channel. And I will see you there very soon.